Okay, so this is the fifth and final video for Unit 3. This time we're going to be focusing on reaction stoichiometry. We're going to use balanced equations to look at uh, what the yield of a reaction should be in theory, or the theoretical yield, as well as uh, the limiting reactant and the excess reactant. And then finally we'll look and see how efficient a process is by calculating the percent yield. So this is where we're going. We're going to look at reaction stoichiometry to be able to calculate uh, grams of reactants reacting or grams of products that will be produced. And we're going to really look at how those coefficients come into play. From there, we'll go into limiting reactants um, and theoretical yield. Guys, I can tell you right now, most students really struggle with this limiting reactant problem. Um, they are long problems, which is why we have a lab on them. Um, they're no joke, so make sure you are comfortable with that before you uh, move on. Oops. There we go. So reaction stoichiometry is going to allow us to calculate mass of reactants that are going to react, mass of products that should be produced within a chemical equation. In order for this to work, you have to balance that equation. If you do not balance your equation, all of your work is for nothing. Now I went ahead and plugged in the mole concept map here because I wanted to make sure that you could see it. Now we've talked about converting between grams and moles this unit. We've talked about converting between moles and atoms or moles and molecules. Now we are going to use the coefficients in our balanced equation to convert between moles of one substance and moles of another. So consider this equation, okay? We have silver nitrate reacting with zinc solid to produce zinc nitrate and silver. Now, we can use our mole to mole ratios to convert between moles of silver nitrate to the moles of zinc that we would need to react. And so by having an information like this, we can actually set up a lot of problems. Um, it just occurred to me I have <laughs> almost no room. So what I'm going to do is just exit this for a second, if it will let me. There it goes and show. And I am going to just um, let's make this um, 16 and this we're going to move way up there and make Except for this, so let's make that a little bit bigger so we can balance it. That should be good enough. Okay, this gives me a little bit more room to work. So if we were to start with 14.1 grams of this, we can calculate the amount of zinc we need to react. We can calculate the um, zinc nitrate that's going to be produced. We can even go all the way to atoms that are going to be produced in the reaction because we have this mole concept map. So we can start from grams of one substance, go to moles, over to moles here of a different substance, and then to something else. It allows us to really relate every item in the balanced equation. So let's just deal with going to the mass of zinc we need to react. Actually, can we do anything? First thing we need to check is that we have what? Balanced equation, right? So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Silver, nitrate, and zinc. We have one, one, and one on the left. One, two, and one on the right. To balance our nitrates, we added two over here, which gives us two silvers and two nitrates. 
to fix our silvers, we're going to add a 2 in front of silver. At that point, we have a balanced equation, and we can look at these next um, steps. Okay? So we have 14.1 grams of silver nitrate, and we want to see what mass or grams of zinc is needed to react with that. So we're going to start with grams of AgNO3. We're looking for grams of zinc. We can't do anything with grams. We always go to moles of AgNO3. From moles of this, we can't go to grams of something else. We have to go to moles of zinc. And then we can get to grams of zinc. To go between grams and moles, we need to use our molar mass. The moles to moles is going to be our coefficients, or the mole to mole ratio. And this is the atomic mass of zinc. I'm just going to say molar mass. Same thing. Now, molar mass of zinc comes straight off the periodic table. Molar mass of silver nitrate does not. We don't have this. We have the balanced equation. We have the periodic table for zinc. We have to calculate this point before we move on. So I'm going to go over here, over here and I'm going to make my little table where we have silver, nitrogen, oxygen, number, mass, and total. We have one silver. We are not considering the coefficient, only the formula itself. So we have one silver. <laughs> Hold on, Emma. Um. <laughs> Hi, Emma. Hold on. Okay, so we were calculating the molar mass of silver nitrate. And so we have A, G, N, and O, number, mass, total, 1, 1, and 3. We're not using the coefficient, only what is in the formula itself. So the mass of silver is 107.9. This is 14.01, and this is 16.00. That gives us 107.9, I guess I should say 0, 14.01, and... 3 times 16 is 48.00. So you get essentially 12, 159.91 grams per mole. And I'm going to go ahead and write that up here. Zinc comes from the periodic table. This is 65.39, I believe. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and erase this molar mass chart just because I don't have a piece of paper that's really big. I need all the space I can get. So if we're going to do this calculation, we're going to start with grams of um, the silver nitrate, and we're going to convert to moles using molar mass, use our coefficients to get to zinc, and then use molar mass of zinc to figure out how many grams of that we need. So we have 14.1 grams of AgNO3 that we're starting with, and we have three steps. We have 159.91 grams every time we have one mole of silver nitrate. Now then, according to the equation, every time we react two moles of AgNO3, we only need one mole of zinc to react with it. And saying that we need one mole of zinc is the same as saying we need 65.39 grams of zinc. So because of this, in our calculator, we can enter 14.1 times 65.39 divided by 159.91 and divided by 2. And that tells us that we need something like 2.88 grams of zinc to completely react with this 14.1 grams of silver nitrate. We could also look to see what mass of zinc nitrate is going to be used. 
So up here we're going to do the same thing. We've got to go from grams to moles of silver nitrate. From moles of this, we can get to moles of this using our coefficients. The only difference is now it's not going to be moles of zinc. It's going to be moles of zinc nitrate. And it's not going to be the molar mass of zinc. It's going to be the molar mass of zinc nitrate. And so because of that, I would go ahead and take the time right now to figure out the molar mass of zinc nitrate. And let's go ahead and do that. So we have zinc, nitrogen, and oxygen. One, two, and two times three is six. Sixty-five, oops, 65.39, 14.01, and six times 16 is 96.0, oh, sorry, 16.00. It gives us 96.00 plus 28.02 uh, and 65.39. Adding these guys together gives us 189.41 grams per mole. So we're going to set it up exactly the same way. We're going to start with that 14.1 grams we have of silver nitrate. We have a three-step process here. Converting to moles, we know every time we have 159.91 grams, we have one mole of silver nitrate. Every time we react two moles of AgNO3 in our equation, we produce one mole of zinc nitrate. Now, every time we produce one mole of zinc nitrate, it is the same as producing 189.41 grams. So in our calculator, we have 14.1 times 189.41 divided by 159.91 and divided by 2. And it looks like we should be getting 8.35 grams of zinc nitrate if we react all of the, that silver nitrate. We could also tie this back in all the way to the number of atoms. We can go from grams of AgNO3 to moles, and from moles we can get to molecules, and from molecules we can get to Ag atoms. We already have the molar mass of this. We know Avogadro's number, so we can do that, and we have the formula, so we can do this part as well. So here we have 14.1 grams of AgNO3, three-step process. We have 159.91 grams every time we have one mole of AgNO3. And one mole is going to have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of AgNO3, and one molecule in this right here has one atom of Ag. So in our calculator we have 14.1 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd divided by 159.91 and you should get 5.31 times 10 to the 22nd atoms of silver. This is um, a good set of examples of what I could do on a test. Generally, I'm either going to ask you for the molar mass of a compound, or I'm going to ask you to convert between things. This is only a three-step process. You should be able to do any one of these 
on a test in under two and a half minutes, especially if I give you the molar mass. You need to become very, very comfortable with these and to the point where you could take a problem like this, change this number to say, I don't know, 41.1 and do the math and make sure you know how to convert to grams of zinc, to grams of zinc nitrate produced, to the grams of silver produced. Any number of these things should be, um, you should be able to do all of it. <clears throat> Here we have an equation where we've got calcium nitrate reacting with uh, potassium phosphate to produce calcium phosphate and potassium nitrate. Before we can even look at the problem, we have to balance our equation. And so we need to do our little tally. We have calcium. I'm going to leave my polyatomic ions together, nitrate, potassium, and phosphate. On the left, I have one, uh, one calcium, two nitrates, three potassiums, one phosphate. On the right, I have three calciums, one nitrate, one potassium, and two phosphates. To balance our calcium, we come over here and add a three. That changes our calcium and our nitrate. And so we have three calciums and six nitrates. To fix our, it doesn't really matter which one you do next. If you want to do nitrate, you can do nitrate next. To fix our nitrates, we come over here and add a six. That changes both our nitrates and our potassiums to six. At this point, we need to fix our potassiums. We need to multiply this by two, which is going to give us six potassiums and two phosphates for our balanced equation. And guys, you can kind of see how much easier this is leaving your polyatomic ions together than trying to balance oxygen separately. It's just less counting. So let's look at the problem. If we were to begin with 22.18 grams of potassium phosphate, what mass of calcium nitrate is needed to react? Well, I'm going to go ahead and give us the molar mass because at this point, molar mass is on another video. I need to assume that you have that uh, down. And so the molar mass of pota uh, potassium phosphate is 212.27. The molar mass of this is 164.1. So this is 212.27 grams per mole. And this is 164.1 grams per mole, or close enough. So to do this, we're going to start with grams, because that's what we're given. We're going to go to moles. From moles, we can get to um, the moles of the other substance, and then we can go back to grams. Anytime we go from grams to moles, we use molar mass. And anytime we use mole to moles, we're going to use our coefficients. Because our equation is balanced, we have that, and we have the molar mass. So we can actually go ahead and set this up. So starting with 22.18 grams of K3PO4. We know every time we have 212.27 grams, we get one mole of K3PO4. Having two K, uh, moles of K3PO4 gives means that we need to react with three moles of calcium nitrate. Once we know the moles of calcium nitrate, we can talk about the grams that we need to react. CaNO3, 2. At this point, grams of K3PO4 cancel, moles of potassium phosphate cancel, moles of calcium nitrate cancel. It gives us grams of um, calcium nitrate. So in our calculator, we can enter 22.18 times 3 
times 164.1 divided by 212.27 and divided by 2. It gives us 25.72 grams of calcium nitrate. We could also look at the grams of calcium phosphate that would be produced in this reaction. Now again, I'm going to go ahead and give us the molar mass of that just because I think you should have that already, that down. And that is 310.24. So the molar mass of this is 310.24 grams per mole. And we can set up this problem. Again, we're going from grams to grams. So it's going to be a three-step process where we convert to moles before we go to moles of the other substance and then back to grams. So starting with 22.18 grams of K3PO4, we know every time we react 212.27 grams, we have one mole of K3PO4. In the reaction, we always react two moles of K3PO4, and we're going to produce one mole of Ca3PO4-2. And producing one mole of calcium phosphate is the same as producing 310.24 grams. Now, in our calculator, we can do 22.18 times 310.24 divided by 212.27 divided by 2. And you should get something like 16.21 grams of calcium phosphate. Okay. We could also look at the atoms of uh, uh, phosphorus that are used in this equation. In order to do that, it goes all the way back to a few slides before, uh, excuse me, a few videos before, where we're going to go from grams to moles. From moles, we can get to molecules of K3PO4, and from molecules, we can get to atoms. So we know if we have 22.18 grams of K3PO4, it's the same as having 212.27 grams underneath one mole. Having one mole is the same as having 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Oops. And every time you have one molecule of K3PO4, you have one P atom, or one atom of P. I like to do it that way. Now, this means in our calculator we have 22.18 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, divided by 212.27. And you should get something like 6.04 times 10 to the 21 atoms of phosphorus. Now, those may seem like long problems. The problem is limiting reactant problems are actually longer. And so you really need to become comfortable with stoichiometry because this is what we're going to be doing for basically most of the rest of the semester. So a limiting reactant is the concept that you can only do as much as you have. So a chemical equation can only proceed while you have both reactants in your beaker. Once you've consumed one of those reactants, you can't continue, even if you have a lot of the other things sitting around. So the reactant that runs out is called the limiting reactant because really it just limits the amount of product you can make. The reactant left over um, is going to be called the excess reactant because 
is present in excess. So consider sandwich makings. You have an entire loaf of bread. Let's just say that that's 12 pieces of bread and two pieces of bologna. It doesn't matter how much bread you have. You have enough bread here to make six sandwiches. 12 pieces of bread, you need two pieces of bread per sandwich, pieces of bread cancel, it tells you you have six sandwiches. Two pieces of bologna, and no smart Alex where you might want one sandwich with two pieces. Here we're gonna make bologna sandwiches, one piece of bologna per sandwich. Pieces of bologna per sandwich cancel, you're left with two times one divided by one is two sandwiches. It does not matter that you have enough bread to make six. Once you run out of bologna, you're done. And so you can't make more than two sandwiches. And so we were gonna say, for us, the theoretical yield of the sandwich makings would be two, two sandwiches. It's all you can do. Um, we could actually even talk about what reaction, what reactant is in excess. Because we know that this is our theoretical yield, we could go back and figure out how much bread is left over. We know that the bologna is our limiting reactant because we're gonna run out. We know that our theoretical yield is the number of sandwiches. And we could go back and say two sandwiches. We know every time we have one sandwich, we use two pieces of bread. We're gonna use four pieces of bread. Well, we used four. We originally had 12. 12 minus four means we have eight pieces of bread left over. That is how much is in excess. And that is kind of a concept that you will do in lab um, in a couple weeks. So let's go back to this calcium nitrate problem where we reacted that with potassium phosphate. Let's say you begin with 10 grams of each reactant, which is limiting. It technically doesn't matter which thing you aim for, you just pick one. Since I have these, hmm, molar mass is already the 310.24 grams per mole, the 212.27 grams per mole, and the 164.1 grams per mole. I'm gonna just see how many grams of this reactant we can make if we completely react 10 grams of both of these, okay? So we have 10 grams of this and 10 grams of this. Let's see how many grams we make with um, just reacting the calcium nitrate first, okay? And I really don't want to do everything in the same color, so let's do green. Now, we're starting with grams. We can't do anything with grams. We're gonna to go to moles. From moles of calcium nitrate, we can get to moles of our product, or the calcium phosphate. And from that, we can get to grams. Going from grams to moles uses molar mass, and from moles to moles uses the coefficients. This equation is already balanced. I've already given you the coefficients from the previous slide. So we can just go ahead and plug this in. So we have one, two, three arrows, so I need three columns. And if we start with 10.0 grams of calcium nitrate, two, we know every time we have 164.10 grams, we get one mole of calcium nitrate. According to the equation, every time we react three moles of calcium nitrate, we produce one mole of calcium phosphate. 
and every time we produce one mole of calcium phosphate, there should be a mole in there, we are producing 310.24 grams. So in our calc, um, so in our calculator, we can enter 10.0 times 310.24 divided by 164.1 and dividing by 3. And we get something like 6.30 grams of calcium phosphate. Now, on the other hand, we need to also see how much we can react, or how much calcium phosphate we can produce if we react all of the potassium phosphate. Same process, just a different molar mass. So 10.0 grams. We know every time we have 212.27 um, grams of K3PO4, we have one mole. According to the reaction, every time we react two moles of K3PO4, we are going to produce one mole of calcium phosphate. And every time we produce one mole of calcium phosphate, two, three, we're going to produce 310.24 grams. So this time in the calculator, we have 10.0 times 310.24 divided by 212.27 and divided by 2. And if we react all of the potassium phosphate, we could produce 7.31 grams of calcium phosphate. Now, it doesn't matter that we have enough potassium phosphate to produce 7 grams of our product, or 7.3 grams. The fact of the matter is, we only have enough calcium nitrate to produce 6.3 grams. So that means this is going to run out first. It produces less. So this calcium nitrate is limiting. Now guys, I want to point out something here. We started with 10 grams of each. It does not necessarily have to be a bigger number of grams to indicate the limiting reactant. You have to go through the math. And so here, even though these were the same, the calcium nitrate is limiting because of the stoichiometry. Look here, we have um, H2 reacting with chlorine to produce HCl. This is not a balanced equation. We actually need to add a 2 here. 2 hydrogens, 2 hydrogens, 2 chlorines, 2 chlorines. If we were to start with 7.15 grams of this and 15.01 grams of chlorine, which one is going to be limiting? Well, the only way to tell that is to really look at the grams of product that are going to be produced. So we're going to do the same process as before. We're going to go from grams to moles of our reactant. From moles of our reactant, we're going to go to moles of our HCl product. And from moles of HCl, we can get to grams. Although, honestly, I don't ask you for grams, I guess. So let's just do moles. Whichever one produces the fewest is going to be limiting. So for H2, we've got a two-step process. We do need the molar mass of H2, two hydrogens. Each one has a mass of 1.01, .01, gives us 2.02 .02 grams per mole for hydrogen. If we start with 7.15 grams, now let's go ahead and do all the molar masses. Cl2 is two chlorines. Each one has a mass of 35.45. Gives us a mass of 79.90 grams per mole. 
HCl, you have H and Cl, one of each, 1.01, 35.45. Overall, you get 36.46 grams per mole. Okay. We know according to our molar mass, every time we have 2.02 .02 grams of H2, we have one mole of H2. Every time we react one mole of H2 in our equation, we produce two moles of HCl. So in our calculator, we have 7.15 divided by 2.02 .02 and times 2. You get 7.08 grant uh, moles. I'm sorry, moles of HCl that you could produce. On the other hand, if we do it for chlorine, here we had 15.01 grams of Cl2. Every time we use 30. 79.9. That is wrong. That's a 7. That should be a 70.90. I'm sorry. 70.90. You get one mole of Cl2. And every time you react one mole of Cl2 in this reaction, you produce two moles of HCl. So in our calculator, we have 15.01 divided by 70.9 and times, oops, times 2. And that gives us 0 0.423 moles of HCl. So here, it does not matter that we have enough hydrogen to produce 7.08 moles of hydrochloric acid. We only have enough chlorine to produce 0.4 moles. So the chlorine is limiting here. There's, it does not matter how much hydrogen we have. It's going to be in excess. We only care that this one runs out. Now, believe it or not, when that theoretical, mm -mm, when the limiting reactant runs out, that is going to determine how much of product that could be made. And we're going to call that our theoretical yield. So, for example, a few minutes ago we did this problem where we had calcium nitrate reacting with potassium phosphate to produce calcium phosphate and potassium nitrate. What is the theoretical yield of calcium phosphate if you had 10 grams and 10 grams? Well, we can actually go back to this problem. And you're going to look and see which one is lower. Because it doesn't matter which one is bigger. You can only make the smaller amount. It didn't matter, for example, that we could make six sandwiches with the bread. We only had enough bologna to make two. So two is our theoretical yield. Here, because we only have enough calcium nitrate to make 6.30 grams of calcium phosphate, our theoretical yield is going to be 6.30. Oops, I'm sorry, wrong slide. 6.30. Same thing here. We know that based on the math that we've already done, we can only produce 0.423 moles of HCl. That is our theoretical yield. Because chlorine is limiting, that is the only amount, and I can't believe I've already forgotten that number, 423. That is the only amount of this that we can make. 
Now, if you wanted to, you could convert this to grams using the molar mass that we have, which is something like 36.46 grams over moles, or grams under moles of HCl. You can tell it is late. One mole of HCl, 36.46 grams. So in your calculator, you can go through the math and say, uh, 0.423 times 36.46, you should get something like 15.42 grams of HCl that can be made. Either one is acceptable. Um, it just depends on the units that they're asking for. Now, in general, we can talk about how much you should make, but the fact of the matter is, in lab, nothing ever goes right. In fact, if you take organic, a lot of times uh, organic chemists tend to be happy if they get 5 or 6% of what they should have gotten according to the, uh, the reaction. And so what we really want to look at in, in addition to theoretical yield is the percent yield. This could also be kind of called the percent efficiency, I guess. You want to look at what you actually produced in lab in your experiment over what you should have made theoretically times 100. Now there are actually times where you could produce more. Um, usually you're going to have a loss due to spilling or something like that. Um, but anyway. So let's say in lab you did this equation and you wanted and you actually produced 12.81 grams of hydrochloric acid. What was the percent yield if you should have if you should have produced 18.16 grams. Well, this is actual over theoretical times 100. You actually in lab produced 12.81. You should have produced theoretically 18.16 grams. And then we're just going to multiply by 100 to make it um, a percent. So you have 12.81 divided by 18.16 times 100 makes it a 70.54% yield. That's actually pretty good. If students in my lab get that, I'm pretty content. Um, so that's not bad. Okay, so this concludes this unit. Um, hopefully it was helpful.